Now we get to a little fun. Uh, Liz, please come up, is a Cabell descendant. And the Cabells were uh, known to own just about every square inch along the James at one time, uh, a number of plantations. Uh, and Liz has spent, I know, thousands of hours researching the stories and background of this small community of Wintergreen. And she has listed on a uh, uh, slide here this many stories that she's written that are accessible by you uh, in the Nelson County Historical Society. Uh, she has uh, presented the newsletter there. Uh, I hope you've got some coming up. But wonderful writings. And I think she's got a little story for us. But please come up. And I, do we have a background? We have a background a slide on. Uh, she's got the name up there, Elizabeth Cabell, uh, Guy Richardson. Uh, William Cabell, I think some of us have probably heard of the William Cabell uh, of Nelson. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead. I've been asked to tell you all a little about what life was like in the earlier days in this county. What popular um, activity was distilling? And I will read an excerpt from my proposed book about a local example. Um, in the 1800s and for several decades into the 20th century, most farms in the southern Rockfish Valley had their own still houses. Before Prohibition, these were often utilized for making apple brandy rather than corn whiskey. Brandy and cider were good, good ways of using some of the extra apples, from, uh, which were one of the main cash crops in Nelson County during this time. If the liquor was for your own use, you did not need a license. But if you intended to sell it, a license from the federal government was required and a, t a tax <coughs> imposed. At Wintergreen Village in the late 1800s lived one John Ganaway, a storekeeper who became an ultimate entrepreneur when it came to distilling and selling liquor. He apparently had a hard head for business but didn't mind circumventing the law to make a profit. He reportedly had a distiller's license from the government, which allowed him to sell apple brandy by the gallon or barrel, but not by the drink. He got around this regulation by claiming to have sold his customers a gallon, which they kept at his store, and from which they conveniently, conveniently bought individual drinks when they came in. Not surprisingly, the store come tavern became known for its unruly crowds who entertained themselves by drinking and fighting. <laughs> Ganaway is said to have eventually given up storekeeping for the potentially more lucrative business of distilling and selling liquor in large quantities. The first year he embarked on his liquor production, he reportedly had four stills going at once. He made over 100 barrels of apple brandy but only reported and paid taxes on two. <laughs> he, he then hid the remaining barrels throughout the neighborhood in tobacco barns, corn cribs, ice houses, and in the homes of friends. However, someone reported him in his hiding places to the federal revenue agents, who descended on the area en masse, confiscating all of Ganaway's secret stash. The agents are said to have barred 20 wagons from local farmers to transport the contraband to the Rockfish train depot, where it was taken to a warehouse in Charlottesville. A railroad conductor later reported that the train was held up for at least an hour loading the barrels, some of which sprang a leak. He claimed that one could smell brandy for 10 miles behind the train. <laughs> Supposedly, Ganaway's congressman helped him avoid jail, but he heavy fines caused him to go broke. Undeterred, he applied for a license to distill corn whiskey, which unbelievably was granted. <coughs> he built a new distillery and bonded warehouse to government specifications and rented all available land to grow corn to supply his distillery. 
It is said that the government posted an inspector to keep an eye at all times on the unrepentant store and tavern keeper. <laughs> Thank you.